must know, we're having a, a special lecture at 7.45 this evening by Professor Clausen, and she wrote this book on the cartoons. And it should be at 7.45 at the SSS building at um, 1 Prospect Street. It should be a good lecture. Next week, Alan Dershowitz is coming to screen a film um, that he was involved in the production of. Uh, it's called The Case for Israel. It's a good film. And Brandon Friedman is coming from Tel Aviv University. He's a very good scholar. And he's looking at ideology and foreign policy in Iran. Uh, he's based at Tel Aviv University. So that's that. Um, just for the few of you who are here, I'd like to reintroduce you to two of our returning scholars, Kosmina Paul and Indi Shalev have come back from, uh, from last year. They're still, they're still here, they haven't come back. <laughs> they're still here, they're gonna be with us another year. And I'm very pleased to uh, introduce you. So Kosmina is doing work actually in the Holocaust um, in Romania, and she's doing really groundbreaking historical research on uh, mass killings in Romania during the Holocaust and just after the Holocaust. Um, she's doing very important work. Edith is doing work on, more recently on Hamas. She's uh, coming from a background in psychology and looking at issues of motivation and I guess dehumanization and uh, what motivates yeah. members of Hamas, how they're motivated to, to hate and to kill. It's very uh, important mm -hmm. groundbreaking work as well. And this year, Anesh Prasad is coming from Canada. Uh, he's here as a graduate student. He's doing work. He's, he's did really important work on um, dealing with issues of peace between Israelis and Palestinians and uh, cultural studies and that sort of thing and, and issues of anti-Semitism. And he's from, from Canada, which makes him a great scholar, inherently. <laughs> <laughs> um, Orlinka Becker is from Germany. Uh, she's doing work on European and German relations to the Middle East and specifically to Iran. And she was instrumental also in starting the Stop the Bomb campaign, uh, which was very successful in Germany and Austria in raising awareness and consciousness about uh, Germany's and Austria's relationship to the revolutionary re regime in Iran. So she's done really important work as a political activist, but also as a, as a scholar, so we're grateful that she's here. And Michelle Sif is here, and she's doing work on anti-Semitism and human rights and the human rights culture. Um, she worked with UN Watch and, uh, uh, sorry, right. Human Rights Watch, I keep saying that. Human Rights Watch, and um, has a PhD from Colombia and did work in Africa. So she's coming from a human rights background and looking at uh, an emerging discourse, which unfortunately, with the Gladstone Report and other issues, is becoming more and more important how the human rights um, culture, if you will, is contributing to the delegitimization and demonization of Israel. So Michelle's work, unfortunately, is important and she's uh, doing very important work as well. So I think we have a really nice group this year. So those of you who are interested in any of these issues, please feel free to speak to our scholars and residents. And, uh, and we're off to a good year as a group, which is nice. Okay. So while the technical issues continue, are there any, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. Are there any questions? Or, I know Lauren will send out more information next week about parking. I know many of you have trouble parking. So. Okay. Okay. So today we are pleased. To finally introduce you to Orly Rahaminian. Excuse me. Uh, Orly is from the Middle East Studies uh, program or department at Ben Gurion University, and this year she is the Phyllis Greenberg Greenberg Heidman and Richard Heidman Fellow at the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies in Washington at the U.S. Uh, United States Holocaust Museum. Orly. Um, has a master's degree in Middle East Studies from Hebrew University. Um, she's received many international and national scholarships and prizes, and she has a new article that's just come out called The Jewish, the Jewish Community in Iran, in a book entitled Iran Today, an Encyclopedia of Life in the Islamic Republic, which was edited by Daraj, and is out on Greenwood Press. So today, Orly is 
title is um, Representation of Jews in Revolutionary Iran, and obviously a very important issue. So welcome. Um, thank you so much, and th thank you, Charles, for uh, having me here. Thank you for coming and being patient with all the problems that we have. Um, I would like to start with a quote from Roya Hakakian, the resident of New Haven, by the way, uh, from her book, The Journey from the Land of No. She was born and raised um, as Jewish Iranian and came to the United States in 1985. And in her book, there is an imaginary monologue that she gives to one of the revolutionary guards to whom she addressed as brother or sister. This is the official um, address in Iran. And I'm quoting. Excuse me, brother, but you don't want to arrest me. What would I have to do with politics? You see, I am a Jew. Allow me to spell it. Capital S, P, I, N, E, and then less, as in without. My mother, father, brothers, and all of our ancestors are Jews, generation after generation of cowards. Yes, brother, only money is in our mind, gold to be exact. In this low market, like today, silver too. Yes, sister, arresting me would be a waste of your precious time. This book you see in my bag, some Muslim classmate gave me. Otherwise, what would the likes of me ha um, have to do with Maxim Gorovsky, John Steinbeck, never heard of them, George Orwell? Pshh. You look at me. Do I look like someone who gives a damn? What is not um, your beautiful handwriting on the wall across our door, Juhud's? go home, Jehud is the derogatory way to say Jew in Iran. My real homeland is Israel, true. I wasn't born there, went there as a child once, can't carry on conversation in Hebrew, don't write it or speak it with my family. Still sister, for me, there is only Israel. Allow me to correct that I mean the occupied Palestine, as you can see. So, um, the aforementioned uh, quotation is an abstract of the Jewish stereotypes in revolutionary Iranian society. In this paper, I will survey the historical progression of various Jewish stereotypes that dominated Iranian society and popular culture throughout the last three decades, since the Iranian Revolution of 1979. This paper will show that Jewish stereotypes in Iran are caused by and reflection of the political and social transformations that took place in Iran during the last 30 years. In light of the wave of anti-Semitic discourse in contemporary Iran, it is important to examine the historical and cultural progression of Jewish stereotypes in Iran throughout the revolutionary period. This paper offers both a complex and contemporary treatment of the subject matter, exploring the multifelicity of representation of Jews in revolutionary Iran and the dispersion of these Im images throughout Iranian society. Before exploring Jewish stereotype, I must introduce a, a short survey of the historical forces that shaped Iranian-Jewish interaction throughout that time. During the 20th century, Iran experienced two opposite political regimes. From 1925 to 1979, Iran was ruled by the Pahlavis. This secular monarchy sanctified modern values and looked to the Western world for economic and political inspiration. During the Iranian Revolution of 1979, Iran, Iran became an Islamic Republic ruled by clerics with only a nominal adherence to uh, traditionally democratic values. 
In a break with the Pahlavi monarchy, post-revolutionary Iran embraced religious values rejected modernization, and demonized the Western world. The Islamic Republic indeed ended the autocratic government of the Shah. However, the rejection of the monarchy's politics did not translate necessarily into, the, into a rejection of the cultural foundations of the Pahlavi regime. For example, to this day in Iran, Nowruz, the Iranian New Year's um, is still celebrated, although it is a Zoroastrian holiday. Many cultural groups of pre-revolutionary Iran have permitted the new regime by way of cultural translation, as I will show. This research as a whole seeks to historicize and to contextualize the formation and this um, the formation of Jewish stereotypes in Iran, focusing on a number of pivotal issues. Which images and stereotypes are specific to Jews? What are the characteristics and visual motif? How Jew representative in Iranian media, literature, popular culture? Are there a number of repeated motifs in Iranian discourse? How were all stereotypes of Jews presented and how new, how new images arose, and how does the political history affect these stereotypes. Saying that, I'm going to focus today um, in this talk only on the period of the um, last 30 years since the Islamic Revolution. My dissertation as a whole uh, deals with the whole 20th century and uh, trying to answer these questions. But today I'm only focusing on the last decades. In order to present a comprehensive description of these images and stereotypes, I draw upon sources such as Iranian press, television, cinema, journalism, textbooks, interviews I have conducted, solo historical documents, which is text about the history of Judaism or Zionism, which um, trying to be historical, but depart from standard academic procedures. And I will give some examples. Theological writings and archival documentation, which I have gathered from different archives all over the world. Discussion of different images requires acquaintance with the Iranian history and society. I will first explain briefly the historical and socio-economic reality from which these images stem, and then I will examine the Iranian perceptions which arose from this reality and ideas and perceptions regarding Jews and Judaism. Jews lived in Iran constant, um, um, continuously for the past 2,700 years. However, uh, since this research focuses on the period of the Islamic Republic of Iran, I will give a short, uh, again, brief survey of modern history of Jewish Iranian uh, life, and you can also use your handouts, um, and you can follow the timetable. So, since we are uh, focusing today um, in the last 30 years, the period since the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, I will give some historical background um, and facts about the Jewish, uh, Jews of Iran. Even though on the eve of the revolution, Jews were less than 0.25% of the Iranian population, the estimate number of the uh, Jewish community on the eve of the revolution ranged from 80 to 100,000 Jews. Their economic, professional, and cultural power was out of proportion. And they were, um, and it was actually out of the numerical representation in Iranian society. With the outbreak of the opposition of the Shah in the autumn of 1977, what had been considered the strength 
of the Jewish community quickly transformed its principal weaknesses. The socio-economic status identification with the Shah and his politics and ties with Israel and the United States. The Jewish community thus was viewed by the protesters as an ally to the Shah and part of the ruling establishment and consequently as an enemy of the revolution. After the Iranian revolution, the socio-economic situation of Jews worsened. Due to unfair laws, harassment, and economic losses, some 50,000 Jews immigrated from the country during this time, mainly immigrating to countries in North America, Western Europe, and Israel. Today, there are only 15 to 30,000 Jews remain in Iran. The exact number is unknown. They live in the three major cities, um, Tehran, Esfahan, and Shiraz. You probably heard about the 13 of Shiraz, the arrest, uh, the arrest of the 13 of Shiraz. They enjoy the official status of being a protected minority, Dimmi, if this notion uh, is, uh, if you know this notion, uh, which means they are a protected minority under the laws of Islamic Republic. Official recognition of minorities was rooted in the Iranian constitution. You can see uh, the articles that are dealing with uh, un-Muslim minorities. Um, the constitution dictates that the Islamic Republican government and Iranian Muslim must treat non-Muslims according to Muslim principles of um, ethics and justice. The Jewish community is also represented in the Majlis, the Iranian parliament, and this is the Jewish representative in the Majlis today. So, um, we can go now, if there isn't any question, uh, to deal with the representations of Jews in revolutionary Iran. Before the revolution, as I show in my dissertation, the Jews and Israels were presented as powerful or heroic figures who survived the Holocaust and rebuilt their ancient homeland. These images were the opposite of the negative stereotypes associated with the weak, greedy, diasporic Iranian Jew. The establishment of Israel gave birth to a new representation of the Jew as a hero in Iran. However, socio-political development, such as the Israeli conquest of the Palestines, especially after 1967, the increase in criticism of Zionist thought, and complex attitudes about international Jewish influence and the effect of the Holocaust once again soared Iranian attitudes about Jews. These factors created an anti-Jewish backlash, a backlash after the establishment of the Islamic Republic of Iran. The idea of the historic Israeli Jew that had been prevalent in the 1960s and 70s was replaced in the years after the revolution by the idea of the Zionist Jew borrowing building blocks from the images of the Zimmi or impure Jew that had been current at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century in Iran. This negative representation had been enriched with Christian anti-Semitic ideas, especially those associations made about Jews in the European anti-Semitism. Another characteristic of the post-revolutionary era is the widespread of denial of the Holocaust, which pulls Israeli and Nazi history alike in a black hole of destruction and conspiracy. The positive pre-revolutionary Jewish stereotypes have been reversed to themselves and created anti-heroic Jewish images. These post-revolutionary representations reflect 
a reimagined re revival of anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic images and the rhetoric which brought the Jewish-Iranian anti-hero into creation. Now I will, sh I will give some uh, explanation that um, will, um, um, will could be a good example for all everything that all the, all the conclusion that I have made to this um, tonight. So um, during the revolution it, itself, and especially after Black Friday, Black Friday, um, September 8, 1978 a day in which many Iranians were shot um, and there was a, a following Black Friday a wave of anti-Israeli statements swept over Iran affecting also the Jewish community. After Black Friday, Kehan, one of the most widely dis uh, distributed newspaper in the country, reported on June 12, 1979 that Israeli commando took part in Black Friday and supported the shock. The newspaper added that Israel has recruited a group of Iranian Jews dressed in Iranian army uniforms who fought against the, demonstration, the demonstrators. After Black Friday, cracks appeared in army lines and the death and the public reaction to them has been described as a pivotal event in Iranian revolution when any hope for compromise between the protest movement and the Shah's regime was um, extinguished. So this is um, the watershed. Israel was viewed by the 1979 uh, protesters as an ally of the Shah and part of the ruling establishment and consequently as an enemy of the revolution. Jewish-Iranian families also found themselves stig uh, stigmatized during the revolution as being servants of the West and were accused of despoiling Iranian households. The well-known Iranian scholar of modern Iranian history, Ervan Ebrahamian, asserts that, quote, the Jews were depicted as imperially spies and agent. They were seen as the real power behind the imperialists plotting to take over the whole world." End quote. The um, reaction was quick to come. After the revolution, uh, during the revolution, a uh, graffiti of the world of the word Jehud is the regular name of um, nickname of Jew appeared on the walls accompanied with the swastika. Not only uh, the usage of these terms revived, but also the connection that came with them. Many negative Jewish images which has receded during the Pahlavi era from Iranian conscious and uh, resurf resurfaced again in Iranian popular culture. Bless you. To some extent, the original stereotypes of the Jew as a cheater, peddler, coward, which um, dated back to the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century in Iran, reappeared after the revolution and pulled from the image's toolbox in a new interpretation. The revival of the old stereotypes are described in another story told by Hakakian. As a teenager, she was caught by the revolutionary guards because she had um, some kind of pamphlets in her um, back, backpack. While searching her back, the policeman found a traveler's prayer in Hebrew, Tfilat Adir, among her belongings. And by that, he found out that she was a Jew. In response, the policeman said, Jews are cowards. They never get mixed in politics. Ha, and we thought we had got a pack of leftists or royalists. After he found out that the whole group was Jews, he said ironically, since when do Jews know how to climb mountains? It happened in the Al Gore's mountains. It seems that this revolutionary guard 
just finished reading the entry juhud in the Persian Dictionary for Common Phrases, which was published in Tehran in 1962. This dictionary defined the word juhud as follows. Juhud, Yahudi, Adam et Tarsu vakamdel vajo'at, a Jew, a scared and cowardly person without courage. And you can compare it also to the 1933 Oxford English Dictionary defining the Jew. One of the anti-Jewish concepts which made a significant return in Iranian rhetoric was the idea of Jewish impurity, Nejasat. Shia Islam views adherence to religious minorities as impure, Najis, whose touch defiles the devoted Muslim. The notion of Nejasat was a tool in order to mark the Jews as others, distinguish them out of the Muslim society in the shaping and critical years of the revolution and during Iran-Iraq war. For example, my uncle that worked as an engineer in Tehran told me that after the revolution, his colleagues used to put his cup that he drank from in different places. Homa Sashar, who was a well-known reporter for um, the Keihan Daily newspaper in Iran between 1968 and 1978, depicts in her memoirs how on October 8, 1979, Mr. N.A., the editor of her, depart uh, of her department, didn't allow her to serve a Khomeini's arrival to, pa to Paris, saying with anger, what are you thinking, little girl? You think they are going to let some Jew translate reports on Ayatollah Khomeini and a woman Jew at that? The news will get defied, end quote. At this time, another distinguish began to be made, the one between the corrupt Zionist and the Iranian Jew. Israel began to be viewed as a demonic and imperialist and imperialistic called little Satan. And while Iranian Jews on the other hand considered as an important integral part of Iranian national history protected and respected under Islam laws. In 1988 so, uh, the, in 1988, the movie Sorb, directed by Masouda Kimiai, a well-known Iranian director and filmmaker, conveys an interesting message about Jews in Iran. Namely, that Iranian Jews are considered an important and integral, integral, integral part of Iranian his, uh, national history. The movie suggests that since Jews are an important part of Iranian history, they have no reason to seek a homeland outside of Iran, such as Israel. So their homeland is Iran. How, however, this line between Jews and Zionists often blurred. The terms Jew, Zionist, and Israeli are negatively intermingled in Iranian conscious. Abrahamian emphasized that Khomeini often referred to the Jews with the derogatory term Yahudi, rather than the more neutral one, Kalimi. Kalimi stems from the name Kalimullah, the one who talked to Moses, which is the Jew, the, which is um, Kalimi, is they are the um, descendants of Moses, which are the Jews, who are the Jews. In an interview I conducted with an Iranian immigrant to New York in her 20s, she said that she recalled that the term Yahud or Yahudi had a negative connotation and suggested a connotation to Israel or even a synonym to Zionist, 
while Kalimi, the official terminology for Jews, had positive connotations. Through both words means the same thing. She also stressed that some Iranian distinguish between the terms and perceived it, perceived it as referring to different groups. Kalimi, Yahudi are different groups. They're not the same Jewish people. The film Jews of Iran, maybe um, you heard about it, directed by Ramina Farahani, filmed in Iran during 2002-2003, reflects this, this shift in perception. In one of the scenes of the film, a Muslim student is asked if she, uh, if she spends time outside of school with her Jewish classmates. She responds that she never refers, she, she prefers not to, and that, she's saying, I'm quoting, because of the atmosphere that Israel has created, I'm not fond of Jews. The director keeps asking her, and he's saying, pointing out that Iranian Jews are not Israelis. To which she answers that she dislikes them because of their religious affiliation and that the Jews also keep to themselves. The blurring that occurs sometimes in the mind of Iranians between Zionism and Judaism is also promoted by the extremist views of the Islamic Republic regime. A major feature of the Iranian introduction to the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, published in the 1980s by one of the institutes belonging to the regime, is the equation of the Judaism mentioned in the original protocols and Zionism, which is not mentioned in the original Russian document. The title of um, the book, as you can see, Protocol Haya Danish Baran Sahyon, Barnamaya Amal Sahyonism Sahyonism Jahani. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a program of action of world Zionism. So the titles draws an equation between Jews, Judaism, and Zionism. Hamid Reza Shaykhi, the editor and the translator um, of the protocols, um, states in the introduction that the protocols are, not, um, are one of the most important documents for the understanding of Zionism and world Jewry. And he posits a direct connection between Israel and the international Jewish community. Um, this actually demonstrates how the protocols is used by the current Iranian regime to justify the struggle against Zionist Israel, which is viewed as illegitimate West Western colonial entity. This idea found in the many versions of the protocols, and there are also and the protocols also correspond with other images of the Jews in Iran in other media. If you want to learn more about it, you are most welcome to read my upcoming uh, article about the protocols of the elders of Zion in um, Iranian political and cultural discourse in the upcoming um, book. Uh, published by Esther Webman. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the one hatred years myth and its impact. As mentioned above, although, uh, although a distinction was made, Iran's public culture is not innocent of anti-Semitic images, even against Iranian Jews. The image of the Jewish peddler going around to Muslim houses in order to sell his merchandise, returns to the cultural prominence by, by um, the Iranian cinema, by means of the Iranian cinema. In 1991, the award-winning movie, Pardeya Acha, The Last Act, best film, best director in the Fajr International Film <coughs> Festival, the most important film festival in Iran, 
Muluk, one of the major characters in this film, prohibits her brother Kamran from being cheated by a Jew when he attempts, her brother Kamran, when he attempts to sell his um, antiques to this Jewish merchant called Esha. Um, I'm going to show you this clip so you can see it yourself. Do you want me to turn off the lights? This is the first scene of the, of the movie, the, the last half.
the suitcase, the money, um, many, many trips that um, are well associated in Iranian culture to Jews. I also talk about uh, Jews in Iran, images of Jews in Iranian cinema in a different um, article that's going to be published. So, in the days after the revolution, the important Jewish figure from European anti-Semitism appeared. Again, the negative stereotypes of the greedy Jew is revived and placed, and placed in a modern Iranian context. In the recent years, the Islamic Republic of Iran has become, uh, has become a major center for disseminating extremi extre extremist views about anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. These views combine typical Western Holocaust denial claims with, with ideas derived from Muslim anti-Semitism and certain distinctive anti-Jewish revolutionary assertion of the Islamic Republic. In addition to the protocols, anti-Semitic books, and this is only exam some examples, slogans, cartoons, television shows, and films have primitive Iranian popular culture. The Iranian government, government fosters anti-Semitic publication and declaration in different ways, especially in the last decade. Since Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was elected as Iran's president in, 19, in 2005, he declares from various podiums that the Holocaust is ambiguous and dubious. During his presidency, he held the International Conference of Review of the Holocaust Global Vision in Tehran, December 2006, with the participation of representative of the Neturei Carta group. He also supported the 2006 International Holocaust Cartoon Contest which was a car cartoon competition sponsored by the Iranian newspaper Am Shari, following the Muhammad cartoons crisis that you're gonna um, hear about more about it today in the following lecture. And here are some cartoons um, from this competition. This is the one that um, won the competition, by the way. Following the competition, in September 2008, Iranian students released a book um, around the Iranian Quds Day, um, a Quds Day or Jerusalem Day, International Jerusalem Day is the last Friday of Ramadan, exactly like the one that was uh, about a week and a half ago. Um, that all that again there were a demonstration as part of the Green movement. And in September 2008, Iranian student released this book containing um, cartoons of the Holocaust, including some uh, depicting hospital hospitalized Jews, uh, sorry, you can see it here, connected to prison machines. And this, uh, it's attached, if you can see, to counts of Cyclone B. Notice the image here uh, on the book cover. And as you can see again, Jew with a hooked nose, side locks, dressed in a Jewish traditional orthodox clothes, black and white suit, and black hat, which has, by the way, nothing to do with the way Iranian Jewish characteristics in Iran where you can see, for example, um, paint from the beginning of the 20th century um, depicting Iranian Jews, and this is how they look like. By the way, uh, if you wonder um, where I work these days, so um, I, this is a cartoon, one of the cartoons in, from the Holocaust book, and it depicts the Holocaust 
the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, as you can see, Musea Holocaust. And you're probably asking yourself, so what I'm doing there? So here is the answer. This is me. <laughs> <laughs> So, Iranian regime does not stay only in the public sphere, sphere sorry, but also penetrates into textbooks issued by the Ministry of Cultural, Culture and Islamic Guidance. According to a report of the Center for Monitoring the Impact of Peace, CMIP, Iranian books about modern history contains, contain very brief references to Jews and not a single mention of their culture, history, including the Holocaust, or achievements. Rather, the books claim that Zionism attempts to achieve Jewish world dominance. The report shows that there is one instance where a picture in um, story appears in a third grade um, pupil book. Um, and you can see this is the, uh, the picture. Um, equates the Jewish symbol, as you can see here, on the, the Star of David with the garbage man. And it seems, if you can take a look at this um, image, it seems that the garbage man in the stories, in this story, echo back to the idea of the impure Jew. Let me explain. Mm -hmm. um, as I previously discussed, after the revolution, perception of religious mi minorities, um, mainly uh, discriminatory perce uh, perceptions, were widely circulated. Among these perceptions is the idea that Jews are impure, not Jews, both personally and spiritually. One of the terms of abuse being used against Jews is Jehud al-Kasif, dirty Jew. The illustration from this 2004 children's book placed again the impure Jew at the bottom of the, society, of those, of the social hierarchy. The Jew, according to this book, is filthy, a pig cleaner, and a coward who can be overpowered even by a bunch of little children running after him. If you will notice here in Persian, the assignment in the book asks if the children asks if the children would uh, like to tell the story. Yeah? And it's proving that this representation of the Jews is in, um, indoctrinated into Iranian children uh, from an early age. And also, it asked the, the children to use some cultural codes. As you can see from the next stem that issued in 1991 by the Islamic Republic of Iran on the occasion of the International Child Day. Um, and I, but I'm, I will talk a little bit about this symbol of the Star of David. Um, already in the 1950s even, we see that the Star of David be, um, being interpreted as a proof of Jewish attempt to um, control the world. However, um, and this also continues into the area of course following the revolution. However, we can also see that in the, during the Pahlavi era, the Star of David has some other interpretation um, of, admi of admiration for Israel, of uh, Israeli independence, as you can see in the cover of um, a travel log from 1956. But after the revolution, we find books that the symbol of the Star of David is um, the symbol of Zionism, desire to control the world. You can see it here, here, all over. 
this is another book that actually was written by the end of the, of the 1960s, was published in the, uh, the beginning of the 1980s. Originally, the name of the book was Velayate Israel. Israel County, if I translate. Uh, can we translate to it um, this way? And here, up in the 80s, the name was changed to um, Velayate Israel. Okay, the death angel, Israel is, instead of Israel. So also for this reason, we find many car uh, cartoons in the International Holocaust cartoon context dealing with the theme of the development of the Star of David out of swastika, and they made a connection between the two symbols. The Zionist actions and their aspiration are compared to those of the Nazis. Israel and the Zionists won't hesitate <coughs> to trample anything in her way to global expansion. Um, in the caricature, this one, from the Holocaust cartoon book, a book the patient who is being driven, this one, is covered uh, with a flag, the Israeli flag, as you can see. And it's not used only to identify uh, him as a Jew, but also as a metaphor for the state of Israel that her basic existence relying on the Holocaust. This is why the denial of the Holocaust is a major instrument in the hands of the Iranian regime. Since, if not for the Holocaust, um, the state of Israel didn't have the right to be established. Holocaust denial drops the ground to Israel's right to exist as you can see in this cartoon. The current Iranian regime asserts that not only did the Holocaust not happen, but if it did, as my, some of you may have seen in the CBS uh, interview with Ahmadinejad last week, um, Zionist Jews orchestrate this genocide in order to force the state of Israel to come about. This idea is well presented in the series Madara Sefteraje, Zero Degree Orbit, um, that was screened in Channel One between April to November 2007. It's a series about a love story between Habib Talsan, this guy, which is a, who is a Muslim Iranian man, and Sarah Stroke, Jewish woman. Uh, living in France, and the series leads up to the big secret that is revealed at the end of the series. The Nazis and Zionists have collaborated together during the Holocaust in order to assure the existence of the state of, the state of Israel. This assumption is proved by documents that Professor Weiss, Sarah's uncle, yes, succeeded in transferring her before he was murdered by Zion. Based on the Havara Agreement, an agreement signed in 1933 between Nazi authorities and the Jewish agency in order to help facilitate the immigration of German Jews to Palestine, the series emphasized the attempts of the Zionists to lay their hands on these documents so that the plot won't be revealed. But at the end, he does. But I should mention also that on the other hand, this series opened the Iranian viewer to some facts about the Holocaust. It refers explicitly to the Crystal Knight and the construction camps. Moreover, the series deals with some um, other issues, such as the uh, differentiation between Zionism and Iranian Jews, the place of Iranian Jews in Iran, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and Iranian policy during World War II, and, um, and some other um, 
issues I won't um, deal with right now. I just want to, um, before I'm going to uh, end this talk, I want to show you the last book issued by, published by um, Dr. Ahmadinejad. <laughs> um, it was re recently published, May 2009, and since I've been in the United States, I was able to um, order it from Iran. And it was published in Iran by the Center for Research and Documentation of the uh, Republic's Presidency, entitled, as you can see, uh, Downfall of the Holocaust Myth. And this book deals with the history of the Palestinian problem, uh, the implication for uh, the Palestinian problem to the rest of the humankind, the connotation between, again, Jews and Zionism, the connect connection between the Holocaust and the establishment of the state of Israel. And finally, the book analyzes um, the important role of the unity and revolutionary Iran in freeing the holy city of Jerusalem. Ahmadinejad makes it very clear that this land is Palestine, and again, a connection can be made between um, Israel and the Holocaust and the leg legitimacy of the state of Israel or the unlegitimate uh, state of Israel. Um, to conclude, the idea of worldwide Jewish or Zionist conspiracy was born out of historical circumstances and recycled according to different political and historical contexts in the last decades in Iran. The Iranian regime goes even further and combines revived images in order to show that the Zionist conspiracy is motivated by greed and that Zionists use the Holocaust as an excuse in order to steal a piece of land from the Palestinians for their own. Old stereotypes return to the screen, but they have been formed in order to serve the new socio-political circumstances. These different sources created a sophisticated and multi-layered world of Jewish representation in the eyes of the Iranians. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for uh, an in-depth and good, interesting paper, a good paper. Um, I was tempted to, to say the spirit of engagement that is sweeping the land. Perhaps we should invite uh, Dr. Abdelrizad to, to speak. to speak. Yeah, much welcome. Yeah, it's jet lag. <laughs> so, are there any comments or questions? Professor Khan. Uh, I just, I just wonder from your assessment of uh, the situation um, of the atmosphere in Iran. Um, how much is the public actually behind all those views that I mean, for us we listen to it and it, it sounds really like a completely absurd from a different planet, but obviously it is there. How much of it is actually taking grip of? Thank you so much for your question because it's a good question about the, ref the reception of, of these um, images in Iranian public. So first of all, as I mentioned, um, this Iranian girl who said, "I don't want to, do, I, I don't want to do uh, to have anything, any connection with Jews because they are this and this and this," and she didn't pronounce it. And she didn't say it explicitly, but you could see um, that she is very hesitated and very um, um, don't want any connection with the Jews at all. On the other hand, uh, there are other groups in Iran, and I read about a year ago a report made by an Israeli uh, journalist who visited Iran. Uh, saying that he hardly found any versions, any uh, copies of the protocols of the elders in Iranian stores. And 
what they know, um, but again, what they know about Israel is um, what the regime tells them, which is the Palestinian, the, 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 um, the way that Israel uh, takes use of the Palestinians, the way that Israel actually uh, treated them very harshly. Um, so we can see that you know, in some manner there is influence of, um, what, uh, of the messages that the regime is conveying to the public. And saying that, I should also mention that um, Israel in some way became, especially lately, in the light of the Green Revolution, a tool by the hands of the um, demonstration. Let me explain. During the Shah's time, if you were pro-Israeli, you probably were you probably were pro Shah also. This is why um, I show in my research after the Israel-Iran soccer match in 1968, a year after the Six Day War, um, there was a big demonstration after this um, soccer match, in which, by the way, Israel lost, uh, in front of the, U the U.S. embassy, uh, which. Uh, the demonstrant wanted also not only celebrate the Iranian uh, winning in the competition, but also showing that uh, being against Israel or winning in a way uh, in the in the match is was it was um, winning in uh, in kind of a um, war field. Um, so it was also, Israel was used in order to be anti-Shah, anti, -Shah, anti um, the Shah's policy, which meant the connection between Iran and the United States and Israel. Nowadays, if you say, if you want to show, uh, or if you want to be part of the uh, opposition against Ahmadinejad regimes, you might find some Iranians that they are pro-Israelis. Maybe they're not, they don't show it um, publicly. But for example, in the last Ruse Kotz, when they started um, demonstrating, and when they started to say, Mark Bar Israel, there were, there were others who started to say, Mark Bar Rusie, Mark Bar Turkiye, Mark Bar other countries, in order to weaken the sound of other voices, the voice of Mark Bar Israel. So, but saying that, they wanted to say, we're not against Israel, we, are against, we don't have anything against Israel, we are opposition to the regime. So in a way, Israel is sometimes a tool in order to express either you are pro or against the current regime. Um, I, I was a little surprised in your review of the content of the, the new Iranian anti-Semitism that there was not much by way of religious themes. That, in other words, if you look in the Quran, if you look in the Hadith, you'll find plenty of material that an anti-Semite could use. And um, I think that it has been used in, um, in a fair amount of Arab anti-Semitism. It's, it's sort of surprising that a regime that is religious in nature that decides to be anti-Semitic would not be playing up these religious sources for, for Jew hatred. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. Uh, first of all, they do use the notion of Nejasat, which is a powerful notion because it defines exactly who is us and who is there, uh, who is them. Um, so this is um, one of the notions that reappeared after the Islamic Republic. Uh, um, and also, um, there is what, what, is, uh, what has been done in this uh, field is that the protocol, for example, 
um, I couldn't show you because um, it's only an image, but if it used to be a very thin book, it became a very thick book. So you would add one. So what happened, they, um, the, before the protocols, there was um, a long survey of uh, polemics between Muslims and Jewish and anti-Jewish um, polemics using in order to show that the Talmud is incorrect. So, they're in, so they took, they take the um, modern anti-Semitism and they combine it with a traditional anti-Jewish, um, uh, traditional polemics. And in this way, it's stronger, the message is stronger. So they do use it. And um, there was another thing that I, I didn't have enough time to show you, but for example, another thing that um, lately I saw two examples, uh, they're using um, Purim in order to show that the first genocide wasn't in, happened in the West. Uh, it wasn't the Holocaust. It wasn't the genocide that the Jews did in Iran killing these 75,000 Jews, if you remember in the chapter 9 in the um, Esther book, Esther's book. Um, and so again, there is this use of um, holy book in order to, uh, to um, convey anti-Semitic messages. And again, also they, uh, a lot of books are translated from Arabic. Um, a, a lot of anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish books uh, translate from Arabic to Persian. For example, if in the 1940s the protocols of the elders of Zion were translated from the Russian um, original uh, version, nowadays it's been translated from the Arabic version. Uh, just as a point of information to Neil, I think the rejection of the regime the rejection of Israel by the regime I think is based on religious precepts, i.e. that uh, the other Jews are not, it's not recognized that others control Islamic space mm -hmm. or have self-determination over Islam. So this is, you know, so pre-67, post-68, there's a rejection of Israel based on religious grounds or a narrow reading of religious uh, text. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Dimi, uh, Dimi that um, the perception of Dimi is uh, a protected minority, and it, it should be um, protected by Islam. And for this matter, he, he, he couldn't have his own independent country. Thank you for this. Because of the anti-Semitism in Spain during the 15th century, many of the Jews converted in order to uh, is there, is there any evidence of conversion or a similar type of approach in, in Iran? Um, the, okay, in the 20th century or in, in, before? Yeah, 1499, when the Jews were expelled from Spain. Oh, back then. Um, no, no, but he meant, he meant these days, if you see like the same pressure, to convert into Islam. Oh, oh no, no. Um, Jews in Iran um, stick to their to being Jews. They're not converted. There was a, a one very major incident called the um, the Mashadi converters in nine, in nine, in eighteen thirty nine, which the whole community in Mashhad was forced to convert into Islam, but they still uh, preserve Judaism uh, in secret. So. Um, not many Jews attempt to um, to convert into Islam in Iran. No, I should send you a paper. I just received a paper, and this is not my area of research, by a Swiss scholar who's comparing uh, the reform movement within Judaism in Germany to the Baha'i movement in Iran in the 20th century, and how a lot of Jews became Baha'i, and this is sort of the, yeah. the reform Judaism, the reform Judaism of Iran is, is but very But nowadays, paper. yeah. But nowadays, you won't uh, find a lot of Jews that convert. This was this was very One yeah. Day, the, during the fifties, a, a lot of Jews converted into Baha'ism. 
because it was an easy way to still be, uh, you can still practice Judaism while you're being a Ba'i, but you, um, you're not associated anymore with all these Jewish stereotypes. But nowadays what happened in, um, in Iran is um, the same phenomena that the Islamic community is going through. Um, um, since the revolution, the Islamic society became more and more religious, and so and also the Jewish community became more and more religious. We can see that more Jews attend um, synagogues on Shabbat, preserve uh, um, kashrut. Holocaust treated in the 1950s and 1960s oh, and the pre-revolutionary Iran. Um, okay, so I write about it in my dissertation. I didn't have the time to talk about it today, but um, during the 50s, and especially after Eichmann's trial, many uh, books about the Holocaust were published in Iran. And um, um, do I have time? Maybe I can show some images? Sure. So I can, if you'll just give me a chance, I can show some other. So, um, and the Jews were de depicted as, uh, as heroes. They survived the Holocaust, they built a new independent uh, country, although uh, everything they went through. And um, many books were um, published about the Holocaust, partly by the Jewish community, but also by Iranians. And one of the main, um, this is one of the, uh, of the songs that I particularly like because it represents this wave of um, recognizing the Holocaust is by Ahmad Shamlu. And it's from 1950s. And if you can see, he says, the, um, long before Hitler, the butcher of Auschwitz, burned my friends in death chambers. So he refers, first of all, to other Jews as my friends. He admits the Holocaust. Uh, in, the 19, in 1963, the movie uh, Exodus mm -hmm. was uh, screened in Iran by, uh, in the cinemas that are owned by Muslims Iranians. And you can see the synopsis that was published in Etelaat about this movie. So, um, yeah, after the, during the, during the 50s and during the 60s, mainly because uh, many um, Iranians, from the left uh, wings especially, visited Iran, Israel, sorry, were impressed by the Israeli policy, by the idea of the new Jew, by the idea of the kibbutz, and they were trying to imitate um, Israel uh, as being a very small country that stands by herself, um, but everything changed after 1967. Um, 1967 is the war shape, um, also in the Israel-Iran relationship back then. We shouldn't forget that during that time in the 50s and 60s, the relationship between Iran and Israel were very strong and a lot of scholars from Israel visited Iran and vice versa. Not only scholars, um, policemen, um, people from the Mossad and the Savak. I understand that the, uh, the Constitution does state uh, a statement about piety of 
Muslims, but not about prayer. In other words, you, you commented there seemed to be more religious fervor. And it, it would appear that uh, in, in their constitution it talks about piety. Okay. And, and so the example would be praying five times a day, for example. Is that more rampant, more common? I don't think so from what I've uh, read about what's happening. Of with course, there is also a difference between the law and the reality. Right. Even if the law is uh, that the Jews or non muslim are not, not just, there is other uh, examples that there is Jews and Muslims that are best friends. Okay. Even in my own family, I have some examples. So there always, this is why it's so important to conduct oral, uh, uh, interview or history interviews in order to know whether how if the if the law was uh, just stating on this level of law or it was uh, the uh, people followed this law of right. course for on the both sides sometimes the Jews were as you said they should have treated Jews um, kindly and with the ethics by the ethic of ethic uh, uh, Muslim law. And they didn't do so. On the other hand, we saw some examples that although there is this nejasat, um, impurity rules, many Jews and Muslims were good friends and helped each other and helped them even to um, flee Iran. Thank okay. you. Uh, can you, can you um, talk a little bit about uh, anti-Semitism in Iran as compared to other Arab nations and other differences? Or in one of the um, articles in, um, I think it was 2006, um, they interviewed the Jewish representative in the Madras. Not this guy, Siamak Muwetzedev, the other one, Maurice Mortone. And he said, how can you explain that still the Jewish community in Iran is the second one after Israel in the Middle East? Still there is... Um, let's say between 15 to 30,000 Jews. And, and especially on the background of all these anti-Semitic declarations um, by Ahmadinejad and so on. And he said that still um, graveyards in Iran are not damaged. Um, there is respect to Jews. And the, the, the number of incidents, for example, in France is much, much higher than the one, the, in, than anti-Semitic accidents in Iran itself. So how can we explain it? Because they do draw the line that distinguish between Jews, Israelis, Zionists, and Iranian Jews. They are protected. Some will, some will say also that Ahmadinejad uses the Iranian community in order to show that he doesn't have anything against Judaism, as long as they live under the Islamic laws. Is there any uh, encouragement of Jews to emigrate from Iran, and, is, and do, do many people take that up? Okay. Um, a year ago, um, an organization uh, came with a suggestion that every family that has, that um, there are six members, if she will, if she will emigrate from uh, Iran, she will uh, receive $10,000 per person. I, would, I can tell you that only 20 people accept this. So. 20 families, sorry. So, uh, why? 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 Oh, the, this is another lecture. <laughs> if you can say, I, can, I think if you want, I can send you an article I wrote about it. About uh, it called My Homeland, uh, My Exile, The uh, Complex Identity of Iranian Jews. It, it's my understanding that the Jews who remain in Iran are the poor Jews. Not mainly, because many of them stayed in Iran because, um, or they had or they purchased during this, the, the last decade uh, um, assets and they don't want to stay, to leave them behind because according to the Iranian law, if you immigrate, you can't take your property with right. you. You can't take the money out. This is why some of the Iranian Jews prefer to stay in Iran. The greedy Jew. <laughs> Just kidding. 
when you show um, how the image of the Zionism and the Israel and the image stereotype of all the Jews are constructed, they reason uh, the images in themselves and uh, the discourse associated they resonate uh, very much with uh, what we can meet, and uh, I think it is uh, very common for everyone in the new left uh, Western European milieu. So, uh, would they be, and even this uh, case that uh, in the 60s, after uh, in the late 50s and 1960s, and around the Eichmann process, everyone in even in the new left in Western Europe was knowledge about Holocaust and was paying homage to the victims. So, we have the same situation in Iran. And in, in the late 1970s, we, we, we meet with this um, Ashkenazi Nazi and uh, Israel Nazism and anti Zionist propaganda. So, uh, how much sh would you say that we talk about uh, something that is specific of, of, it, of Iran, or we talk about a more uh, larger context and they legitimate their perspective through the intellectual discourse? Um, what I'm trying to show in my research is exactly what you're saying that it's not only Iranian, uh, it, it, the images are not derived only from Iranian culture, that it's cross cultures, cross countries, uh, there are different images that you can find all over. It, the, it's the greedy Jew um, um, that we find in the 19th century and we can find also in the Merchant of Venice. If it's the smart Jew that we can find in Iran and in other Muslim countries, yeah, I'm also trying to show that um, there are influences and also uh, um, uh, independent stimulation of images in different countries or cultures that they are alike from different reasons. Maybe the circumstances are similar. Maybe there was um, uh, influence of uh, leftist or anti-Semitist idea, ideas from other countries that some other scholars brought with them when they, for example, studied in other countries. Just as a footnote, my ego is very big these days. I just came from China, and I can't... <laughs> the people that I met in China, their perception of Jews is yeah. that we're very smart and clever. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, if you said so, uh, I just want to give an example. For example, in the 70s, when Chinese, I, I think they visited one someone from the Iran, from Israeli, um, I don't know, some figure, Israeli figure, they gave him as a president uh, a copy of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Great respect. <laughs> <laughs> so, any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank for you me. so much. Thank you.